Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the More Excellent Ministry Sunday Evening uh, Bible Study Class. My name is Minister David Lewis Jones. I pray uh, that your week has been blessed and that you are staying safe in all of its ways. Uh, tonight, I want to come before you uh, for approximately an hour or so uh, to talk to you about a very important topic uh, in Christendom, and that topic is salvation. Uh, what is salvation? It is a very important uh, topic, I feel, that needs to be addressed uh, because there is uh, some confusion within the Christian church uh, concerning salvation. So I want to minister to you uh, this evening, if you don't mind, lending me your ear uh, so that I can speak to you and give you a biblical definition of the word salvation. It is very important, extremely important, because I'm noticing uh, various doctrinal teachings and misunderstandings uh, that the Christian church has come across when it means salvation. Uh, as you all know, uh, we have been in the church, most of us, all of our lives, and we have been taught certain things uh, that were not actually biblical or scriptural uh, from a, a Greek and Hebrew uh, context. So we're talking about the universal need of salvation, the universal need of salvation. And that simply means uh, that uh, there is a universal need uh, for salvation for all of mankind. Uh, every human being on the planet uh, stands in need of salvation because the Bible uh, explicitly says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, implying that every man and every woman uh, is a sinner in the eyes of God. So there needs to be uh, an understanding of how we are born into sin. Uh, so there is a need for salvation according to the Word of God and we need to make sure uh, that we understand the word salvation from a biblical uh, context because if we don't get it right in this lifetime uh, there's no coming back again uh, and trying to uh, cover the mistakes that we have. Once it's all said and done and you decease, uh, you will go into eternity. And within eternity, uh, there are two distinct places. The first place is heaven and the second place is hell. So every man and every woman is destined uh, to either one of those two places. So we must, we absolutely must get it right here in this lifetime, what it means to be saved is what I'm going to be actually talking about. What does it mean to be saved? We've heard that expression uh, most of our lives of how we confess that we're saved and we are saved by the blood of the Lamb and I'm saved and I've heard it in the Christian church for many years. Uh, but what does it actually mean to be Safe. So I want to explore the scriptures tonight concerning uh, the word salvation and being saved. Uh, this text that I'm going to be used is coming from the book of Acts uh, chapter uh, 16. I'm going to begin reading at the uh, 25th verse. So it's good to go to the scriptures to find the biblical definition on how to be saved and what is being saved consists of. So we have here... Uh, an incident what took place between Paul and Silas. And the scripture reads here in verse 25, it says, But at midnight Paul and Silas uh, were praying and singing praises to God, and the prisoners were listening uh, to them. And suddenly uh, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison uh, were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were Loose. There was a supernatural earthquake that took place while Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God in the prison. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, noticed the security guard had fallen asleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing 
the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He was about ready to commit suicide. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Notice the scripture says that there has to be some type of action performed. What must I do to be saved? Now, verse 31 is the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? Because it is a universal need. And people are asking the same question today. What must I do to be saved? So let's see what the word of God says here in verse 31. So they said, Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not only you, but you and your household. Household would mean family members, those residing in your house. So here we have from this verse of scripture what to do in order to be saved. Another verse in Acts chapter 2, 37 through 39 says, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This was the time uh, when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. Uh, they asked the question, What shall we do to be saved? What is salvation? Salvation from a, a biblical uh, context means to be uh, delivered. It means to be ransomed. It means to rescue. It means to preserve. It means to be liberated. That's what salvation means from a biblical context. Now we have heard uh, this, at least I have heard this being preached from the pulpit uh, for many years. And that's absolutely, it is absolutely correct. Uh, but there is uh, more to the text that uh, we have yet to see uh, concerning salvation or what must we do to be saved. Now, uh, the scriptures can refer to salvation uh, simply meaning this. It means deliverance from the power, penalty, and the presence and the effects of sin. So there is a threefold meaning to the word salvation or to be saved. It means being delivered from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, and then finally, in our glorified state, when we are in heaven, we will be delivered from the presence of sin. So it has a threefold context. The power of sin, the penalty of sin, which would be eternal separation, death from God, and then finally, the, the presence of sin. So we can say that we were saved at the time, and we've all said it, including myself, we were saved at the time you had an experience, uh, you were hearing the gospel being preached to you in a particular church, and you came forward, uh, you accepted the call of salvation, uh, you may have given the pastor the right hand of fellowship, and you may have made a confession with your mouth. Uh, you may have even gone further uh, to experience uh, water baptism. Uh, so we can say that we were saved according to uh, various verses in the Bible. However, the truth is uh, no man, no woman knows the exact day and time you were saved. No man. What has been uh, delivered to us? Uh, is that we think that the time uh, we came to Christ, or when we believed on Christ and we accepted Christ and uh, we made a change in our life, uh, we call that uh, being saved. But that's not what the scriptures teach. Uh, because uh, to be saved uh, consisted first in the mind of God consisted first in his mind. In other words, God in his infinite wisdom, in his foreknowledge, he saved us. He 
redeemed us. He rescued us. He preserved our life from uh, the death penalty of sin. Uh, but the actual act that took place in our life and what many of us have been somewhat confused, even myself until I uh, began to search the scriptures, the process of salvation or the initiation time we were saved, we have no idea when that took place. What we do see is the effects or the results of us being saved, which would be we believed in the word of God that was being preached. We felt the conviction from the Holy Spirit in our life that we needed to be saved from our sins. And then we made a confession and we repented of our sins. And then we water, were water baptized. And then we began to live a life of faith. But ladies and gentlemen, that is actually what the Bible calls conversion. That is not salvation. That is conversion. In other words, uh, the initial act of God that took place in our life prior to conversion, the miracle of all miracles, no man, no woman knows that day or that hour or that moment when God saved you. Now you have to try and imagine this. God knew you before you were ever born. He knew you uh, before you were ever born. A created. So in that infinite wisdom mind of God, God chose you and he saved you at that time. This was before the foundation of the world. This existed in eternity past in the mind of God. God saw you and God chose you and God saved you. So it's not simply uh, the time when you repented, it is not the time that you gave the pastor the right hand of fellowship, uh, which is biblically incorrect. That's not salvation. Uh, nor the time that you were water baptized. These were the after effects or the results that came out of you being saved. So I want to uh, make that clear to you tonight uh, that the conversion process uh, is repentance turning from sin and turning to Christ and then living a, a lifestyle of faith that is not actually salvation. So the scriptures give a very uh, definitive uh, text from Ephesians uh, chapter number two, uh, verse number five. It says, for when we were dead in trespasses, uh, made us alive together for by Christ, with Christ, by grace, you have been Save. And of course we understand and we know this text, we've all read it, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. In other words, grace is a gift from God, it's not of works. There were no works that we could do to earn our salvation, including just being a good person, just being kind, uh, or tender-hearted, those uh, works are as filthy rags before a holy God and they could not save us. We were saved strictly alone by God's grace. So we see here that salvation uh, has a threefold process. We're saved now, we're saved in the past, and we're saved in the future. So our salvation will be complete only when we receive uh, our glorified immortal bodies on that last day. The scripture says we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Yet in another sense, the word save is still yet future because we have not received the final and complete deliverance from all the curse of sin. Simply meaning we still live in sinful bodies we still are being tempted uh, to sin, uh, and we still have the actually ability to sin if we choose to. So we have been not yet totally received the full package, if you don't mind me saying, of salvation. The word saved in the Greek language is called sozo, sozo which means safe 
and sound, safe and sound. It also means to keep safe and sound. It means to rescue from danger and destruction. It means to save a suffering one uh, from disease. It means to make well, to make well. It means to heal. It means to restore to health. It means to preserve one who is in danger of destruction. To preserve one who is in danger of destruction. It means to deliver from the penalties of the messianic judgment. To save from evils which obstruct the reception of the messianic judgment on the last day. It saved means also to be saved from the wrath of God at the judgment of the last day. So I provided for you a more comprehensive uh, definition of the word save. Now the scriptures define that Jesus is the savior of all men. Meaning that does not mean that word savior doesn't mean for the redeemed or to save to salvation. God's grace is not limited to the believer. God's grace is not limited uh, to people who are in church. God's grace is universal. In other words, even the unbeliever and the sinner are still saved in some aspects. Many unbelievers and sinners have testified that they were rescued from danger. Many unbelievers are living safe and sound. Many believers, cancer surviving patients who have no thought of God are being healed by medical technology and being restored to health. So when the scripture says that God is the savior of all men, that is not limited to the born again believer. It's God's saving power or his saving grace that extends universally over the entire world. It's not just limited uh, to the church. So salvation is universal. It is not confined to born-again believing Christians. God's grace extends to the entire planet, to both believer and unbeliever. Uh, unbelievers have testified that they have experienced uh, God's grace, not to salvation, but they have experienced miraculous things to take place in their life. Uh, they have actually encountered angels in tragic situations such as car accidents and fires. So God's grace or God's salvation is not confined to the born again believer or the uh, Christian church. So God's salvation again is universal. However, there's an aspect of that salvation in which we as sinful humans in the sight of a holy God need to be saved from the final judgment or the justice of God that will be uh, given to all mankind on the last day or the end of time. So since salvation begins in this life, uh, it begins and it ends at the time of our glorified body when we are raised for our justification we are raised and receive our glorified body it is a process that takes place from the time that we are born uh, to the time that uh, we go home to be with the Lord so he is saving us and this is what uh, we need to understand if you are a true born-again believer you are being saved in the process. If you can look back over your life and see how God is delivering you and he is separating you from the world and from sin and from lust. He is bringing you, or the scripture says, he is drawing you closer to himself to live a holy, consecrated life. However, we are responsible uh, for keeping our salvation unto the end. And just as we have received past salvation through faith in Christ, we will receive future salvation only if we continue to live by faith in Jesus. And here is where we have 
uh, the difficult or the confusing part of the scripture when the scripture says believe on or believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, when we're reading the Bible from an American westernized mindset, uh, you're going to interpret that word belief meaning simply just to believe, which is absolutely incorrect. You may have remembered this is not an American book. This is a book written by Jews, for Jews, to Jews thousands of years ago from the Far East. So the word believe in the Bible does not mean just believe mentally. It does not mean simply to say, I believe, because there are many people today in the Christian church and outside the Christian church who believe in God, but they are not saved. Because according to the text, according to the scripture, believe is the Greek word pistios. And that means to trust in, adhere to, rely on, have confidence in. Okay? Not simply saying, I believe in God. No. You, according to the text, you must trust in, adhere to, have confidence in, and rely on. In other words, if you are not trusting in Jesus, relying on Jesus, putting confidence in Jesus, and adhering to Jesus by a lifestyle of continuing faith, according to the text, your belief is simply mental, and you are now in a position where you are still unsaved. I have to address this, because many people have actually deceiving or deceived themselves into thinking that if I just believe in God, I will go to heaven. That is absolutely incorrect. You have to trust in, believe in, adhere to, have confidence to, in Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way outside of Jesus Christ that you can get to God because you are a sinner and your sins have to be dealt with. They have to be washed away in order to come into the presence of of a holy God. So believing in Jesus Christ must be a continual lifestyle of trusting in, adhering to, having confidence in, and relying upon Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are responsible for keeping our salvation. We can forfeit our present salvation and our promise of future salvation by a voluntary return to sin and unbelief. I've seen it. I've seen Christians walk away because of unbelief and sin. Uh, they reverted back to their old ways and they fell in a circumstance or situation where now they are in unbelief. I've seen uh, people actually fall into unbelief they may not go back to sinful pleasures, or sinful worldly desires or lust, but unbelief is a lack of faith, and therefore you are unsaved. It's very dangerous to revert back after you have come to Christ. You must continually live a daily lifestyle of trusting in, having confidence in, relying upon and adhering to Jesus Christ. Not simply saying, I believe in God. And many people do. In fact, the Bible says even the demons believe in God. But it would be absurd. Demons will be saved. It is a continual process. It is a continual lifestyle of faith in Jesus. You must carry this faith all the way until the end. So many scriptural passages emphasize this truth. And Jesus taught absolute necessity of abiding in him and keeping him his commandments. And here's another misunderstanding. In order to have faith in or to believe in Jesus, according to the text, you must obey his commandments. You cannot simply say, I believe in God, but disobey his word. 
you must obey the scriptures, the word. That is an extension or expression of your faith and not simply just saying, I believe. Because in order to trust in, adhere to, rely on, and put confidence in what? God. Well, God is his word. And this is where you have the disconnect amongst many so-called Christians who are simply leaving their belief system in their head or in their mind, and they think that they are saved. That is not salvation, ladies and gentlemen. Salvation, according to the scriptures, is obedience or keeping the word of God, trusting in the word, adhering to the word, having confidence and relying upon the word of God. That demonstrates your belief in Jesus Christ, not simply making a public or superficial uh, confession of faith, which many, many have made and have reverted back to their old ways because they did not come to the full expression of salvation. They have left off at some point in time and falling back in unbelief and sin. So we have here uh, that Christ is the source of our faith. In other words, faith comes from Christ, does not come from you. None of us have faith in, in aspects that it did not come from God. The scriptures declare that God has given to man a measure of faith. Some scriptures, uh, text verses, translation says, the measure of faith. So every man, every woman, man meaning mankind, has a measure of faith in order to believe in Jesus Christ or not to believe in Jesus Christ. Because everybody believes in something. You are believing in something or someone according to the measure of faith that God has dealt to every man, every woman. A measure is simply a measure which can increase. Our faith can actually grow. And the measure that God has dealt to every man, every woman born into this world is as the size of a mustard seed. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's a very small seed, but when it is planted, it grows into this huge tree that springs forth branches of, uh, and sprouts out all kinds. So every man, every woman born has a mustard seed. Now, the church has actually misinterpreted the text, saying if you have this faith as the size of a mustard seed, uh, you can say to this mountain. That text actually means that faith is measured in proportions to each and every man and every woman, the size of a mustard seed. In other words, he's stressing the size of your faith because there is great faith, there's a little faith, there's a lack of faith, uh, and then you have the opposite of faith, which would be unbelief. So you have a mustard seed faith in the beginning of your lifetime, and it is up to you to evil allow your faith to grow by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God is simply not saying the scripture hearing by the word of God but a continual hearing of the word of God in other words faith comes by hearing and hearing continually not just on Sunday not just once or twice a week a continual hearing of the word of God verbally being spoken to you over and over again your faith will, will begin to grow. So we have here that every man has been dealt, according to the scripture, a measure of faith, faith as the side of a mustard seed. Jesus also said to his disciples in the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 2, 10, 22, he said that he that endures unto the end shall be saved. The, the key words is end. The end, meaning the end of your lifetime or the second coming of Christ would be the end for all of us. For it is appointed for man to die once and after that the judgment. And then we have to hasten until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's only two endings of our life. Either we die and we're absent from the body, present with the Lord. Or we would be a part of the generation where we'll experience the second return of Jesus Christ. Those would be the two ends. 
So Christ here was saying, explaining to his disciples that it's only when you endure unto the end will you be saved. So implying that many will not be saved who have started out. Many will fall along the wayside. Many will be uh, distracted from worldly pleasures and sin. The cares of this life, according to the parable of the sower, uh, and will not endure unto the end. So it has not yet been known or revealed who will be saved. And I understand the expression. I oftentimes would say it myself that we're saved. But we don't know we're saved until the end. That will determine whether or not you are saved. When you are in heaven and you can experience the glories of heaven, that will be the outcome of your salvation, but you must endure unto the end. So, in the original Greek text, uh, enduring to the end, this one shall be saved, what is actually saved, uh, says, but the word endure is translated from the Greek word hupahune, hupahune, which means to remain, to stay under, uh, to be behind, to abide, to cleave faithfully. This is what the word saved means, or excuse me, endorsed means. So you have to endure unto the end in order to be saved. In other words, you have to abide in Christ. You have to remain in Christ. You have to persevere in Christ. You have to cleave faithfully and bravely and calmly through trials and tests and calamities and infirmities until the end in order to be saved. So as you can see, salvation is yet future for many of us because many will not endure unto the end. A very familiar passage of scripture which we've heard, John 3.16, and it says, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice Jesus is saying again this word belief, meaning adhere to, trust, and have confidence, and rely on. Not simply saying, I believe in Jesus. No, that is not salvation. You must endure unto the end. You must abide in Christ. Jesus gave it a great analogy and he talked about a branch and how branches would be cut off uh, because they did not abide in the vine. They were useless branches and they did not produce the fruit uh, that God called them to do. And they were cut off and the scripture says they were thrown into the fire, which means these were Christians who at one point in time believed, they adhered to, they trusted, they relied on, they had confidence in but at some point in time in their life, sin and unbelief crept in and the scripture says they were cut off and they gather them and they throw those branches into the fire. Christ was actually speaking on the last day of judgment where he will separate uh, the just from the unjust, the sheep from the goats, and even them who did not continue all the way unto the end, they will be cast into the lake of fire. This is very important, people. This is very important because your eternal destiny lies on what you believe is absolutely biblically correct and not just assuming that the pastor or the preacher has told you is correct. You must find out the truth. You must be a truth seeker. So belief, according to the scriptures, means to trust in, rely in, adhere to, and have confidence in Jesus all the way unto the end. You must persevere. You must cleave faithfully. You must remain. You must abide in Christ in order to guarantee your salvation. So here uh, we also have in the Greek text uh, the word believe would mean uh, to you, which means to have confidence in, as I said, to trust in to trust in Jesus, to be persuaded of, or have a firm conviction in your heart. To believe firmly, to have a, a strong persuasion in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord 
and he is the savior of my soul. So here the word belief is in the present tense, implying that continual present belief is necessary for salvation. Continual present belief, not wayward, not going astray, not falling, reverting backward, but a continual present belief is necessary. According to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, a salvation comes to those who move from faith to faith, to those who lived a lifestyle of faith, faith in God's word, not just faith in just believing, which many people will automatically do. Trust me, your brain is uh, Americanized and it's been uh, indoctrinated to a certain extent, if not all, uh, to think that belief is simply just mental. No, no. It, belief has to do with the work, which means you have to have a strong confidence in, to be assured of, to be persuaded of, trust in, rely, have confidence in Jesus Christ for your salvation. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 says that uh, we cannot save ourselves or by our own power or earn salvation. We must continuously abide and entrust to and adhere to Christ. In short, we have not yet all received the eternal benefits of salvation and yet therefore salvation is still a hope. The scripture says we are saved by hope and we have the hope of salvation according to Romans chapter 8 24 and 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8. But this hope of future salvation is more than just wishful thinking. We have the promise and the assurance of salvation if we continue to walk in the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only way to obtain eternal salvation is simply to find present salvation from sin and this life. Which brings us to the question, how can I be saved from sin in my life? Well, let's look at what Jesus spoke to Nicodemus uh, according to his uh, gospel, according to St. John, chapter number 3, verse 3. Again, you have Nicodemus who comes to Jesus by night, and Jesus confronts him because he understands and he knows what's on the mind of Nicodemus, and he begins to tell Nicodemus the practical way and both the spiritual way of how to be born again. He said, you must be born again, born of the water and born of the spirit. In other words, if you do not receive the born again experience, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, he's talking about a present tense or a time in which people who are saved will come into this experience being born of the water and born of the Spirit. Many Pentecostals and Apostolics believe that the water is referring to water baptism. However, you have other a group of Christians, the Evangelicals, who simply mean that it is the washing of the Spirit. Uh, nevertheless, there is an experience that takes place in which initiates you into the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God and how does it relate to salvation? The word kingdom and God expresses God's sovereign rule over the entire world. That is the kingdom of God. God rules and controls every single thing that takes place in this entire world. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has a present and a future aspect to it, meaning at the present time it is invisible. We cannot see the kingdom of God with the human or the natural eye. However, the invisible will one day be made visible and there will be a literal, physical kingdom set up here upon earth and where Christ will rule and he will be the head of all government and principalities. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at Hey, notice he says repent, which means turn turn away from your sins. According to the book of Romans chapter 14 verse 17 says uh, the present aspect of the kingdom consists of his a certain riches or his 
kingdom blessings that temporarily come down through the Holy Ghost. So we must apply Christ's words here when he refers to being born again or born of the water and born of the spirit in this life in order to inherit the kingdom of God. Present salvation consists also of the freedom or the dominion of sin and the penalty and the presence of sin. You cannot save yourself. You cannot deliver yourself. You cannot stop sinning in and of yourself. No matter how hard you try to stop. If you stop one sin, I, trust me, there's going to be another sin that's going to come up into your life. We have absolutely no power outside of the Spirit's powder, power to stop or to resist sin. This is why we need, need to be saved. Future salvation consists of eternal life free from sin and the consequences of sin in that aspect. Let's listen to what Peter has to say on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 souls were added into the kingdom of God. In short, Peter begins to preach to the Jews and the, the apostles of that time and they asked Peter, what must we do to be saved again? There's something that you have to do. And it's just something It's not simply saying, I believe. Okay. Well, let's look at the answer according to, uh, he says here in Acts 2.38. He says, repent. That's number one. You have to turn from your sins to the best of your ability. In other words, the habitual sin, the sin that you practicing, the thing that you know that you are doing wrong. You don't have to tell anybody about it. God knows. You know what you're doing, which is absolutely wrong. That must stop. That has to cease from your life. Then you must be baptized in water. This is what Peter said. Repent and be baptized. He says, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, which means forgiveness, of sins. And then he says, this is what's going to come. He says, after you do the repentance, after you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the promised power from on high, so that you'll be able to live a godly, holy lifestyle by faith in order to be saved. He says this is the biblical answer of the question, how can I be saved? These things are the conversion process as I spoke to you, not the initial act. But this is the conversion process. Could it be that the conversion process or the, uh, excuse me, the miracle that takes place once you believe in the gospel, God saved you? Or could it be prior to that? Uh, many people have testified that God began working on their hearts and their minds uh, prior to them even coming to Christ or believing or hearing the gospel preached. They just felt a sense of uncleanliness. They just felt that their life was just out of control. They felt heaviness upon them. They felt they needed to change. Uh, this could possibly begin the initiation of God beginning to save them or the miracle of salvation. Okay, so we have here Paul, excuse me, answer, answer to the Philippian jailer. He tells the jailer, this is what you must do in order to be saved. In order to be saved, you must believe on in Jesus Christ. You must adhere to. You must trust in. You must put confidence in. You must rely on Jesus Christ. Believe again is the put the confidence in our, our trust in. It is from a biblical definition which belief includes acceptance of God's word and obedience to it. You cannot say, hear me out. You believe in God if you do not accept and obey his word. If you're doing that, you're deceiving yourself. You are lying to yourself. You must have a change of lifestyle, meaning your life actually changed. True believers, the true believer in Christ undergoes a spiritual transformation in their life. True believers true Christian. At some point in time, there's a transformation that begins to take place in your 
life. Those who simply make a public confession, a superficial commitment in front of people, and then revert back to their old ways, they're not saved. I'm sorry to disappoint you with this news, but I have to tell you the truth in the name of Jesus for the love of God. You have to come to full salvation in order to be saved and enter the kingdom of heaven. Repent, water baptism, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and continue to live a lifestyle of godliness and holiness. Through the Spirit's power, you will begin to be eradicated from habitual and practicing sin in your life. In other words, the pleasure of sin will be dissolved out of your life. You may continue to sin, but there won't be any pleasure in it. God has a way of taking the pleasure out of the sin because we are programmed as sinners. Uh, you will continue and may indulge in it, but it won't gratify. It won't satisfy. You will feel uh, unclean. You will feel guilty or ashamed. That is the evidence of the Spirit of God working in your life. And finally, you'll just totally give it up. That is the miracle of salvation. So again, there's a transformation that takes place for the true believer. They will continue the full process of salvation all the way unto the end. They will keep their salvation by clinging, holding on to, faithfully adhering the commandments and the word of God. And they will continue to have faith to be added to their measure of faith which they already have and they will obey the scriptures and the word of God. Believe on Christ means to give yourself up to him uh, in his own keeping, to entrust yourself in his keeping and you will be saved. Again, Christ here is speaking uh, to Nicodemus. He talks about a future kingdom, but yet it's a present kingdom that would come after the spirit was given. Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost and now the people were being ushered into the kingdom of God. They were repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they lived a lifestyle of faith from that point on. So Peter, again on the day of Pentecost, he gives a direct answer to a question. He says here, you must repent now and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Not something future that needs to take place, but now is the day of salvation, the scripture admonishes us. Now is the day to be saved. For tomorrow is not promised. You must repent of your sin and turn to have faith in Jesus Christ and believe on him. So we have here, we have water baptism and then we have faith or belief in Jesus Christ and adhering to and trusting in and repentance will follow after that. So repentance and faith will lead to water baptism. If a person truly repents of their sin, uh, that faith or the unction or the spirit will begin to draw that individual to experience water baptism. Anyone who refuses water baptism, I question whether or not you're really saved. Because the spirit will lead you to the water. You'll have this longing or this prompting or this desire to be water baptized. This is all a work of the Spirit as I'm reading the scriptures. It's The Spirit does everything from beginning to end. All we have to do is simply comply and be obedient. The Spirit does the work. He's doing the drawing. He's doing the cleansing. He's doing the keeping. He's moving. The Spirit does the entire process. So repentance and faith will lead to water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the birth of the water, and then the baptism of the Spirit is the, the birth of the Spirit. There are other verses that mention salvation that comes through repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ. So we have here first that we have salvation comes through the name of Jesus Christ according to Acts chapter 4 and 12. Then we have confession that takes place as Jesus is Lord and believe in his resurrection and believe in his name. Not simply saying, I believe in Jesus. Many people do. Many people believe and confess that, yeah, Jesus was a real guy. Yes, he was a, as a man anointed by. That is not salvation. Because after that confession, 
They must live a lifestyle of grace through faith, according to Ephesians chapter 2. Then there's repentance that has to be implemented in this process of salvation. Then comes the sanctification of the Spirit and then a life of obedience to Christ. Do not deceive yourself into thinking that you can simply make a public confession and simply say Jesus Christ is Lord and He is Savior of my life and not obey. That is not salvation. One of the three enemies or the three enemies that come to a Christian's life after they have been saved for a number of years. You have eradicated sin from your life. Sin no longer has dominion or power over you. Uh, you have separated yourself or the Spirit has actually excluded you from the world. And then now you have three enemies that will attack your faith. The first one is fear. The second one is doubt. The third one is unbelief. These three enemies uh, attack or come against the Christian in moments of crises, moments of being tested and trials, uh, moments of adversities, and these are designed to get you to fall into full-blown unbelief. Very dangerous because many can actually live a whole life and half of their life, three-fourths of their life, and then there's that one test, that one trial that comes and causes them to doubt God. Causes them to fall into unbelief. And now they have forfeited their entire work of salvation and lost it. They began to entertain the thoughts that come from the enemy. During the time of testing and during the time of trial. This is why it's very important that when you are in a test, that you are in the Word of God. That when you are in an adversity, that you are meditating in the Word of God. Because again, your carnal nature and the enemy will throw these fiery darts at you and you can possibly slip into unbelief. You say, well, I'll never do that. Well, is there doubt? Is there doubt that can creep into your heart? Those what-ifs that appear in your brain. What if God does not heal me? What if God does not come through? What if God... These are small foxes that can steal your faith. And if you don't deal with them immediately and combat them through the word of God, they will begin to pile up inside of you. They will begin to manifest in various ways and you could possibly go into unbelief and lose your entire salvation, all what you've worked for, all the sacrifices that you've made, and all what you've been through, to throw it all away. And Satan is very clever at this because he is a very patient creature. He has all the time that he, he, he needs. And he will allow a Christian to live a holy life and to end up losing their salvation and dying. Going to he said that can happen. Yes, it can. It can happen. You can fall into unbelief by not adhering to, obeying, trusting in, relying on, having confidence in his word. And it won't be long. Your carnal nature, your sinful nature will slowly pull you back, back into the world. And you'll believe that may never go away. You may have this mental belief or this mental uh, ascent of Jesus Christ. But your body, or excuse me, your, your lifestyle will not exhibit a lifestyle of faith in adhering to, trusting in, relying, having confidence in God is in his word. This word is, very, is, is an absolute necessity to the Christian believer's life. And you've got Christians out there who are not meditating and reading the word. They're simply living every day. May not be indulging in habitual sin. They not practice habitual sin. They've had enough faith and enough spirit's power to have a dominion over those things, but they are not trusting in God. They are not obeying His Word. And if they enter into a trial, that one trial that can come and wreck people's lives is the trial when people are passing on. I've seen it. When, when that test comes, if your faith is not strengthened and strong, you can go through that test and you can lose your salvation. You can fall into doubt. And one of the things that I've noticed is that 
our salvation is not yet complete, which means healing is not yet complete. And oftentimes, Christians, we are commanded and exhorted to pray for healing for those of us who are suffering from terminally ill diseases, and then God calls them home, and now I've seen Christians, faith is now shipwrecked. They've lost their faith because they were believing God would heal this person, and that person would rise again, and that person would live again, and yet God does something else. He calls them home, and now they begin to doubt the healing power of God. And if they don't deal with that, that doubt will still stay there. If they don't confess it and if they don't get to God and, and understand that healing is only temporary, it is not full and complete until we receive our glorified body, that is when we will have no sickness and disease or infirmity or any type of illnesses to, uh, to take us, to call us away. So we have a salvation that is not yet complete. Did God heal? our loved ones. Of course he did. God hears and answers all of our prayers. In fact, your loved one whom you prayed for, for God to heal them and God to save them and God to, to restore them and bring them off of their bed of illness, but yet they were called home into eternity. There's no more sickness and disease in heaven. There's no more pain from the cancer in the body in heaven. So yes, God did heal, but he healed them according to his will according to his purpose, according to his plan. It's always not what you want. So now when I began to notice this, when I began to study and see how this has happened, my prayers now change for people who are battling terminally ill diseases. I don't ask specifically God to heal them, but give them life and restore their life and to add years to their life so that their life can be prolonged here on earth. And then, Give them a charge. Allow them to experience the joys and the fruit and the blessings that can come through ministry. Not to just be healed and go sit on the couch and watch TV. No, you have to be sent your request before the judge of all the earth. You have to convince the judge that if he grants and he extends healing to the suffering soul, the soul who is about ready to depart and go be with him. A reason to live. A reason to live. Do you not know, ladies and gentlemen, when you are praying that you are in a courtroom? You are literally, if you could see it, you are in a courtroom and you have Jesus, the judge, who is sitting on the, the bench. And he's listening to what you are praying and what you are saying. And if you've ever been to court like I have, you are at the mercy of the judge and you have to do whatever it takes to convince this judge to pardon your life and to spare your life and this is exactly what's taking place when we're praying so prayers and our healing is limited on this side of heaven it has not yet been fully complete we still have the ability to sin we still carry the sinful nature we are still uh, in these mortal bodies who are subject to decay, to corruption, to bacteria, to infirmities, to sickness, to disease. We haven't been delivered or saved from the presence of sin until we're called home to be with the Lord and we received our glorified body. I wanted to share that with you tonight so that you can understand that what salvation actually is. It is not simply just saying, I believe. It is a doing. It is a acting out or to work out your own salvation as the scripture admonishes us. Meaning, allow God to work in and through you, through his grace, to bring about full, complete salvation all the way unto the end. And our responsibility is to keep it. How do we keep it? We keep our salvation by obedience to the word of God, by complying with the scriptures, by applying the scriptures of God to our life daily. This is not something that you do when you are desperate and life is overwhelming to you or you find yourself in a twix and you begin to know salvation for the child of God. The Christian is a daily thing. And of course, we're human. There are days when you're not going to pray and there are days when you're not going to read a word, but you must make up for it. This is a daily 
act or walk of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We go from faith to faith daily as much as all possible in order to keep our salvation. I hope you're doing this. I pray that you're doing this. I pray that you're not thinking that all I have to do is just believe in God and when my time is up, I'm going to heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. There's work that you have to do. And that work is simply obeying the scriptures and trusting in, relying on, putting confidence in and adhering to Jesus, clinging to him with every ounce of your being. Well, my time is up. Thanks again for hearing this word of God, for lending me your ear this evening concerning the universal need for salvation. Tomorrow night, I'll be teaching our expository, expository learning and Christian education class at Herndon. Please meet me there at the Herndon Library, 768 Center Street, Herndon, Virginia at 7 p.m. I got another dynamic lesson. We're continuing our lesson that we start before on the doctrine of salvation. Again, it's necessary and it's needed. Thursdays at 7 p.m. We have our intercessory prayer. Dial the telephone number, please. We're waiting for you. 609-663-4021 and present your request as we go before the throne of grace and ask for God to uh, do what he needs to do or he desires to do in our life. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. God willing, I'll see you again. Have a blessed evening. Good night.